Sigma has finally brought a zoom lens to the Sony APS-C E-mount universe, and if you're looking to upgrade your kit lens, you should be excited. After absolutely ruling the prime lens market for Sony APS-C with their 16, 30, and 56 mm f1.4 trio, Sigma has released their 18 to 50 f2.8 standard zoom lens for that Sony APS-C system, and it is absolutely tiny, which is totally perfect for this kind of leave it on your camera, super versatile walk around lens. But before I dive too deep into the specs and what I liked and didn't about this lens, I wanted to give you a practical look at some real world usage. So I took the Sigma 18 to 50 out. I shot a short video and a whole bunch of photos along the way so that I could show you. Let's take a look at the video so you can see how it performs in that context. And afterwards, we'll take a look at some of the photos and talk about my experience with this lens. <music> The following video was shot entirely on the Sony A6600 and the Sigma 18-50 f2.8. I've been doing a lot of heading out of town, going down to the mountains and getting hiking in and that kind of stuff. This time I couldn't actually head out of town, so I decided to try and do a hike in Edmonton itself. The one that I'm headed towards right now, my wife and I like to call the sunflower hike because the first time that we did it, there were sunflowers at the end, really beautiful big sunflowers. The second time that we did it, there were different flowers, but the name kind of stuck. So it goes from the north side of the North Saskatchewan River, cross down to the south side, way out to the east end of Edmonton, and then crosses back over the river and comes back. And it's one of my favorite ways to get a hike in without having to leave the city. first part of the sunflower hike is basically just getting out of downtown. But once you get across what I now know is called the Dawson Bridge, we just always call it the Blue Bridge, then you kind of tuck away into the river valley here. And the rest of the hike is absolutely beautiful along the water. I mean, it's almost winter, so it's like everything's dead right now, but it's beautiful most of the time. That is most definitely ice on the side of the riverbank there. Also ducks. Sweet fantasy, beating home. 
just passing the Capilano Bridge, which is kind of another milestone on this hike, walk, whatever you want to call it. It's pretty brown out here. This is a bit of a departure from the normal mountain, beautiful glacier lake hikes that I've been showing you lately. But one thing that's been nice this year in Edmonton is that the water is normally, in my experience anyway, really brown. And this year, for whatever reason, just because of all the runoff from the mountains or something like that. It was actually this beautiful blue-green color, not something that I think I've ever seen in the like 15 years I've lived in Edmonton. So that's pretty awesome. And the woodpeckers today, they are out in full force. I think I've seen four of them already. I had never seen a woodpecker before this year as far as I'm aware. one part on this little hike where the path gets really like up and down and really skinny and there are bicyclists who rip down this part so you really got to keep your eyes open and uh, probably not film yourself for fear of missing someone coming right at you just me. yeah kind of just just like that All right, so we've made it to Capilano Park and we're gonna go this way. I managed to get down this and now I'm starting to wonder how I'm gonna get back up it because it's very muddy. See the final bridge that we're going to use to cross over the river again. It's just too bad it's still so far away. break for some coffee and a snack and then we're in the final little stretch we just got across this bridge and that's uh that's the end at rundle park this is a bit less of a scenic hike than i typically go on when i'm like climbing up a mountain or whatever but it's still beautiful especially in the summer when there's like leaves on the trees or if you catch it in that week and fall before all the leaves fall off the trees right now it's all right. The water's looking pretty beautiful. Seeing the ice on the edge of the water is pretty cool as well. But I think it's time to make that final stretch here. have been any mountains but this is still pretty epic with the sunset and this bridge and the river and as you can see here this is why we uh, called it the sunflower hike because of the imaginary sunflowers that are planted in this flower bed four hours nine kilometers taking it nice and slow definitely not quite the same as what i'm used to when i escape to the mountains but uh fun nonetheless i hope you enjoyed that thanks for watching All right, I hope you enjoyed that a little bit. Let's talk about the Sigma 18-50. to 50. 
The obvious competitors here are the Tamron 17-70 f2.8 and the Sony 16-55 f2.8. But each of these lenses brings something slightly different to the table. Where the Sigma really differs itself between these three is in the size, the weight, and the price. The Sigma comes in at only 549 US compared to the 799 of the Tamron and the 1399 of the Sony. So it's not just like a little bit less expensive, it's actually pretty significant significantly less expensive than the other two. The Sigma is also only 286 grams, whereas the Sony is 490, and the Tamron being the biggest is 526, nearly half the weight of the Tamron. Then when it comes to the physical size of it, the Sigma is only 75 millimeters long, whereas the Sony is 100, and the Tamron is 119 millimeters long. Both the Sony and Tamron have 67 millimeter threads, whereas the Sigma only has a 55 millimeter thread, so it's quite a bit narrower too. So based on all of that, it's pretty obvious what Sigma was trying to do here, make a cheaper, smaller, lighter lens that is good for just kind of everyday carry. And I think they accomplished that, but the question is, are there any compromises in that process. And there are definitely a few things that this lens is missing. Like I mentioned before, it's got a bit of a shorter zoom range than its competitors. Considering that there is a lack of wide angle lenses in the Sony APS-C lens lineup, I think that 18 millimeters might be a bit of a pain point for some people, and they might prefer to go with something that has the full 16 millimeters on the wide end. That's the difference between 24 millimeters full frame equivalent and 27 millimeters full frame equivalent. So if you're someone who does vlogging and needs to be able to hold the camera at the end of your arm. If you don't have big long arms like I do, it might be a problem. And also if you're shooting things like landscape photography where you wanna have that extra wide angle, it's not a huge amount, but it might be the difference between getting the shot that you want and it being just slightly too tight. On the other end of the zoom range, I didn't find it as limiting, but having that extra reach out to 70 millimeters on something like the Tamron might be nice for you. In the end, this focal range thing kinda depends on the way that you shoot and what else you have in your kit. Personally, I was only shooting with this lens and not using any other ones, so I definitely felt the limits of that. But if I was going out with a kit, I might be able to have something for that ultra wide or have something that goes a little bit longer in the telephoto range. The other thing that this lens is missing is any kind of stabilization. Now, luckily I was able to borrow an A6600 to do this test, but if you have something like an A6400 or A6100, something that doesn't have the in-body stabilization, it might become a bit of an issue again, kind of depending on the way that you shoot. So if you're gonna be using this lens with a camera body that doesn't have stabilization, you wanna make sure that your shutter speed is high enough if you're doing photography. And if you're doing videography, you wanna have something stable like a tripod or a gimbal, or even just a neck strap that you can pull tight against your neck just to add that little bit of extra stabilization. The build of this lens is definitely feeling a little bit more plasticky than some of Sigma's other offerings. They're saying that it's a new kind of material that's supposed to be lighter like a plastic but more durable, kind of like an aluminum, and it's supposed to hold up better to harsher temperatures. The zoom and focus rings weren't really anything to write home about. They were reasonably smooth and I didn't have any problems with them, and the barrel does extend when you zoom. There is definitely some weatherproofing going on with this lens. There's a gasket around the mount at very least. When I was out shooting with this lens, the conditions were pretty clear, so I didn't really get to like test the weatherproofing or anything. The autofocus on this lens performed well with very little hunting. I found it really smooth and really quick, and I came back with very few missed focus shots. Now, when I found out that it was as small and light as it was, I was a bit worried that they were going to have to cut corners in the image quality department. But after reviewing the videos and the photos that I got while I was out, I'm really happy with how they turned out. I found that it was quite sharp in the center and the fall off as you went out to the edge was pretty minimal. Of course, it's not as sharp as the Sigma Primes that I mentioned before, but I wasn't really ever expecting it to be. Those things are crazy sharp. I didn't run into any noticeable problems with fringing or flaring, even though I was shooting in some high contrast situations and even shooting straight at the sun. And as far as like the overall look of the image, I never really know quite how to describe it, but this lens has the kind of Sigma look that I personally really like. Something about the color rendition and the contrast. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something that I quite enjoy from Sigma lenses. The versatility of that standard zoom range, as well as the size and weight, made it the perfect perfect walk around lens for when I was out and about. Not to mention that it's significantly less conspicuous than some of my big heavy full frame setups. So who do I think this lens is for? 
pretty much everyone who has a Sony APS-C camera, especially if you have something with the in-body stabilization in either the A6500 or A6600. If stabilization is something that you're really worried about, definitely check out the Tamron 17-70. to But overall, I'd say that this is the best value fast aperture zoom lens for Sony APS-C. This is a really fantastic and reasonably inexpensive upgrade for anyone who has the APS-C kit lens and wants something better in quality, but doesn't necessarily want to lose the versatility that a standard zoom gives you. Not to mention this thing barely takes up any more space than that kit lens. I'll leave a link down in the description if you want to check out this lens more or pick one up, as well as to all the other lenses that I talked about in this video. And as always, I want to hear what you think, so make sure to leave a comment down below, and on your way down there, hit that like and subscribe button. Hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on future videos. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.